So let's talk about storytelling. When we're having a conversation, we usually want whoever we're talking to to believe the tales we tell. We carefully craft our speech so that it jives with what's come before. And while sometimes this means choosing just the right word, other times it can be more about what we leave out. So, what rules do speakers follow in managing their shared knowledge and experience, and how can we represent it? I'm Moti Lieberman, and this is The Link Space. Welcome to the Ling Space. Meaning has two main parts, what our words refer to, and the instructions telling us how to put them together. And this makes up the semantics of our language. But there are lots of different ways to deliver the same message, with rules constraining how we talk. And these rules form the pragmatics of our language, how our words actually get used. Teasing these systems apart, though, is easier said than done. Like, take the sentence, Hunter knows that Nina had a near-death experience. It says that Hunter knows something, whoever he is, but it also carries an assumption, specifically that Nina had a near-death experience. It would be a strange thing to say that if there weren't already agreement on whether that was true, and it would be downright bizarre if people were sure that it was false, and that she'd never had a brush with mortality. This sort of assumption that sentences can come bundled with is called a presupposition, and it's especially resilient. Presuppositions are so strong that even if we pop a knot in there, they stick around. Hunter doesn't know that Nina had a near-death experience still suggests that she had one, even if news of it hasn't reached Hunter. So where does this presupposition come from? Is it part of the meanings of the words, or is it more about the rules of conversation? And how do we even figure that out? A good way to get to the bottom of this is to try to take what's going on and formalize it. That means making our description as exacting as possible, using the tools of math and logic. We've already used things like set theory to talk about word meanings, and that's given us a lot of insight into how language works. So let's see if we can do the same thing here. We said before that a sentence seems weird when its assumptions come into conflict with what the people in the conversation already agree on. So we need a precise way to capture this. One way we can do that is to think of shared opinions as a collection of all the ways conversation partners think the world might be. Not necessarily the actual world, since we can always be mistaken about what's really true, but all the possibilities that line up with their shared experience. So, if two people agree that Homer's Iliad is a great piece of writing, then all the worlds in this set will be ones where it's great. And on the flip side, if neither of them have particularly strong opinions about classical music, then there'll be worlds where it's awesome, worlds where it isn't so awesome, and everything in between. Anything could be possible there. This collection of hypothetical worlds that people agree are candidates for the real one forms their common ground. And as they talk to each other, every sentence updates that picture a little bit more. But while a sentence like, Hunter knows that Nina had a near-death experience, makes sense if everyone involved knows it too, it comes across as strange otherwise. So there's a constraint on which sentences are allowed to update the common ground. Sentences with assumptions that sync up with it get in, but the ones that don't get turned away. It's like a secret handshake, and only the sentences that are in the know can make it through to the other side. With these ideas of the common ground, and the rules that decide what gets in, we've got nearly all the ingredients we need. But we still need a way of explaining why some sentences come with presuppositions and others don't. To do this, we just need to remember what we've said in the past about what sentences actually mean. More than just being true or false, we've argued that it's better to think of sentences like descriptions of worlds. They're functions, or connections, between different possible worlds and the values true and false. We can symbolize how this works using the Greek letter lambda, to represent the fact that we're dealing with a function. So if you take a sentence like, Homer played football, and apply to our own world, where, let's say, he actually did, then the sentence acts like a function and you get true. But if not, then you get false. To represent how a sentence can presuppose something, we just have to limit the worlds where it's allowed to apply. So for our sentence from before, we take the function and tack on a restriction about the worlds that it covers. That statement after the colon tells you what the function can accept as input. And it ends up making the function only apply to some worlds, worlds where that statement holds true. This actually lines up nicely with how we tend to think of sentences that have presuppositions anyway. When the assumption's true, the sentence can either end up true or false. But when it's wrong, though, the sentence doesn't obviously come out one way or the other, just kind of undefined, like the linguistic equivalent of dividing by zero. As for how presuppositions find their way into sentences in the first place, well, a sensible guess is that it's because of certain words. 
After all, if we switch out a word like no for another verb like imagine, so that Hunter only imagined everything, we lose that assumption. So a meaning of a word like no would be something like the meaning for believe, combining sentences with the people that believe them, while also mixing in the requirement that those sentences actually be true. In this way, no basically means believe, but with an added presupposition. Other words like the and both have meanings analogous to a and all, while imposing their own restrictions on what they can and can't combine with. The only works when there's one unique thing being talked about, while both only works when there's two. So our picture of how presuppositions work has two parts to it, a rule on what gets into the common ground, and certain words with built-in limits on when and where we can use them. But does this work for every sentence we see? Well, a good way to test this is to try to apply to other kinds of assumptions, and one variety that looks like it might fit the bill is anti-presuppositions. Where presuppositions require that people take something for granted as true, anti-presuppositions demand that they don't. So just like it's strange to say someone knows something when that something hasn't been established yet, it'd be weird to say something like Nancy thinks her daughter is missing when everyone knows for sure that she is. Using the verb thinks, anti presupposes that the sentence following it is true, so it's only meant to be used when something is unknown. Now, at first glance, it looks like we could just say that anti presuppositions are like negative presuppositions. In other words, just like how the sentence she gained her sight presupposes that she didn't have it at first, maybe the meaning of think looks like this, with the function assuming that the sentence it combines with is false. But this can't quite be right. While it sounds like a contradiction to say she gained her sight and she always had it, it's easy to imagine someone saying she thinks her daughter's missing and she's right. That's because unlike presuppositions, anti-presuppositions can turn out either true or false. All that matters is that they aren't taken for granted when they're used. So what does that say about where they might come from? Well, since anti-presuppositions can go either way, they aren't really about functions only applying in some worlds while avoiding others. It's more like they're saying something about the common ground itself, but it's a bit of a mixed bag. And while it is possible to build that into meanings of words like think, the logic of it actually gets pretty convoluted, opening up other problems. Fortunately, a much simpler explanation is available. Like we've talked about before, speakers tend to follow certain conversational maxims or rules which govern what's said and how it gets interpreted. One of these maxims says that we're always trying to be as informative as we can, meaning that if we deliberately leave something out, there must be a reason. And when we consider the kinds of words we've been talking about so far, it becomes clearer what can be going on. For every word that carries an anti-presupposition, we find a corresponding word carrying a presupposition. That means that a speaker using one of these words implies that they're deliberately choosing not to use the other, since they would if they could. Saying think in place of no suggests that using no would be inappropriate, and that the following sentence can't actually be taken for granted. Anti-presuppositions emerge out of a kind of competition between separate but related words. If we can safely assume then that conversational maxims can be extended to include presuppositions, we already have all the tools we need to explain not only when things get taken for granted, but when they don't. When it comes to sharing our stories, the words we set aside can be just as important as the ones we keep around. So we've reached the end of the link space for this week. If our story is synced up, you learn that certain sentences take some information for granted in the form of presuppositions that these kinds of assumptions come out of the words we use and how well they line up with our shared knowledge, and that other kinds of assumptions, like anti-presuppositions, have more to do with the words that we choose not to say. The Ling Space is made by all of these amazing people over here. If you want to learn more about just why presuppositions are so darn resilient, check back on our website. And while you're there, why not check out our store? We're also on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook, and if you want to keep expanding your own personal link space, please subscribe. And tap that little notification bell down below if you want to find out right when we post a new video. See you next time. Miyadowu!